ready to go. Good evening, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Andrew Leonard from salon.com, your moderator for this evening's program. To my left is Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, uh, who are business researchers at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Eric is the director of the MIT Center for Digital Business, and Andrew is the principal research scientist. Um, the two men made a name for themselves a couple of years ago with their self-published book, Race Against the Machine, which kind of coalesced some uh, emerging nervousness about the fact that automation is really beginning to replace jobs at higher and higher levels. They followed this up with a bigger book, The Second Machine Age, Work, Progress, and Prosperity in a Time of Brilliant Technologies. And it's really, uh, I think everybody in this room will understand how timely this is. Uh, in San Francisco and the greater Bay Area, there's a lot of tension about both how the tech economy is changing everybody's lives and, and you know, what, where we're headed from there. And the second machine age directly tackles uh, both the promise of technology and some potential challenges it poses. So I think both would like to start before questions with giving a, a brief kind of summary of their views. And um, that's, you know, what's the second machine age all about? Well, why don't I start and, uh, and say that the second machine age really got started from some confusion that both Andy and I had about what was going on in the world. Uh, on one hand, innovation has never been faster, but on the other hand, people have gotten more and more pessimistic about their futures and their children's futures, and reflects two different groups of people, two different tribes, really, that Andy and I interact with regularly. On one hand, there are technologists who are observing and, in fact, creating just wondrous new things, uh, self-driving cars and uh, machines you can talk to and other amazing technologies. And they are almost infectiously optimistic about the potential of these technologies to transform the world. But we also spend a lot of time interacting with economists. And there's a reason they're called the, the dismal science. Um, I just came from a meeting in, in Philadelphia, the American Economic Association meeting. And I was on a panel there with three other economists, and they were pointing out some pretty, pretty dismal statistics. Um, as you may know, um, median income, uh, the income of the person at the 50th percentile in America is lower now than it was in the 1990s. And employment, of course, has been struggling as well. The employment to population ratio has plummeted. And while some of the unemployment numbers are a little bit better recently, that mostly reflects people dropping out of the labor force not uh, new jobs being created. And we were puzzled because we wanted to see how can you know, these two groups with these very different perspectives, are, is one right and is one wrong? Uh, or how could these, these facts be, be simultaneously apparent? And in fact, if you look deeper, it, it is true that, that there are some, some really impressive numbers that match up with the uh, optimism of the technologist. Uh, overall wealth in the U.S. economy just hit a record high, $77 trillion. We're at record levels of productivity. GDP is at record levels. Profits at record levels. They're all, and all those numbers are growing quite steeply. But the, but the other statistics about median income and unemployment are also exactly accurate. And ultimately, um, as we were working on this book, we came to the conclusion that uh, it's possible for both these things to be happening simultaneously. Um, it reflects the fact that uh, technology does grow the economic pie. It does create more wealth. However, there's a sort of dirty secret of economics, and that is that there's simply no economic law that says everyone's going to benefit evenly from these technological advances. It's possible for some people to be made not just relatively worse off, but worse off in absolute terms. Now, in the first machine age, it was people like uh, buggy whip manufacturers that were hurt by the introduction of the automobile. But 
Today, it could be a much larger group of people, tens of millions of people, even potentially a majority of people that are having a harder time making a living than they did before. And understanding the nature of these causes and consequences and the central role of technology in driving both the bounty and the spreading out of, of outcomes is what we wrote this book about and trying to understand the implications and, and what it means for, for individuals, for corporations, and for, for society is what we're hoping to refocus the conversation on. Eric and I have spent our whole careers working at the intersection of technology and economics and doing research there. And as Eric says, we wrote this book because we got confused about both the economics and the technology. Eric has just described the economic paradox that was going on. Let me talk a little bit about the, the technology confusion that's going on. It's basically that technology has started, digital technologies have started doing things that they're not supposed to be able to do. Uh, the, the book's genesis for me started in the fall of 2010 when I was over breakfast, opened up my computer and started browsing the New York Times website and came across a story about the fact that Google had been driving, well, not Google, had, no one had been driving cars. The company had developed these autonomous cars that had at that point already driven thousands of miles on American roads in traffic with no mishaps. And I spit out my coffee at this point because they really weren't supposed to be able to do that. There was a wonderful book written just six years earlier, 2004, that Eric and I read, we talked about. The book made a really convincing, strong argument for why computers were really never going to be able to drive cars. And it was basically because the, the sensing, the pattern matching, the processing, all the stuff that you've got to right. do to do that well is Fairly e pretty easy for us and our brains, prohibitively difficult for computers. And Eric and I read that book in 2004. We nodded our heads at each other. Six years later, they're already driving cars. You see similar weirdness happening in a bunch of other really difficult problems that have bedeviled computer scientists and roboticists and other people. Um, we're gonna do a pop quiz. It's gonna be really, really easy. Everyone, point to a door in this room this is a smart crowd. Okay, here's, a, here's an even weirder question. Point to where you are in this room. Yeah, and there's this nice dichotomy. Some folk go like this and some go like, they're both correct answers. We'll accept both of them. My point is you have just solved one of the thorniest challenges in robotics. It's called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. What does this room look like? Where are the doors? And where am I in this room? We are all really good at that. You saw what an ace crowd we have. That program, that, that problem has basically prohibited progress in robotics. You put a robot in a room and ask him where he is and where the door, I'm sorry, he or she is and where the door is, and you just watch the shenanigans take place. As recently as 2008, there was a review of the literature that said, look, we've made no progress in SLAM, nor will we, because it's just too dang hard to do. Uh, last year, a colleague of ours at MIT, a guy named John Leonard, solved the SLAM problem for a room about this size by waving a Microsoft Connect around in it. This is a $150 piece of consumer electronics. So Eric and I saw enough examples like that, and we said, what on earth is going on here? And led us to go out and talk to a lot of the nerds, both on the economic side and the technology side, and eventually led to this book. I think the first question that one would want answered then is, is, is how and why this happened. We've been hearing promises, mm -hmm. especially yep. here where we're you know, just north of where all these things get made, of things that are going to change the world, artificial intelligence is going to solve all our problems, and, and these promises are regularly not delivered on. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now, in the last three or four years, something seems to have changed. Mm -hmm. What? You, can we give you a three-part answer to that question? Because that was really what sent us into the field. Our answer to that takes up about the first third of the book, and there's really a three-part answer. But you're only going to have to do it in just a couple minutes. Here. Right, <laughs> but I'll save you some time. It, it, it's a three-part <coughs> answer. The first part is the relentless improvement in computing power that most of us know of as Moore's Law. And it is really easy to underestimate what happens when this doubling, when this exponential improvement has been going on long enough. Sometimes a difference in degree really is a difference in kind. And we think we're at that point 